I don't deserve this talent that I've been given. I don't deserve the, the opportunities that I've been given throughout my life. So I just want to make sure that I, I do well with those and lean into them for, because it's, it's, I'm just very thankful for them and I don't want it to, to go to waste. Hey, thanks so much for joining us here on the Golfer's Journal podcast. We are here in your beautiful home, St. Simons Island, Georgia. It is beautiful. And we just played a little chess here. Um, uh, you were you were kind to me. You have a lot more of my pieces than I have of yours. But there were a couple moves in there that felt like real chess moves on, on my part. You did have me in check at one point. I, I did have you in check at one point. Which was suicide, but <laughs> but we got it done. It's a beautiful chess set. It's a beautiful a beautiful home, carefully curated art. I love. I mentioned I love how you have your bookshelf. The books are turned the other way. There's a lot of style here. And as Kashmir Keith, you're someone that's known to have a lot of style. Um, so if they say that clothes make the man, what is style and clothes? What what kind of man are you making through? the way you, you know, portray your, the way you dress on the golf course or your setup here at home. Wow. What a, a deep first question. Close. I know I started man. pretty, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, close make the, yeah. That's uh it's a good expression. And it's something I think of as I was reading about how you are really thoughtful about the way, the way you dress. I, w- I would like to think I'm thoughtful about most most things in general. I'm getting that vibe here. Yeah. Um, it's oftentimes too much. Okay. Um, I would, one of my, uh, one of my closest buddies always says about my focus. I go, I oftentimes focus really, really intently on a lot of completely random things, which is fun and when it's off season, but like when it's golf, it can be yeah. extremely negative. But I think it's also how I can channel a lot of my energy, I guess you could say. Um, I'm always, always thinking, creating, designing, whatever it may be. Like I'm in constant, um, just thought in such a general phrase, but in constant thought about whatever's going on. Okay. And sometimes that's too much on the golf course, right? right. Where yeah. You think about too many variables that have nothing to do with actually shooting a lower score. And then sometimes I can come up with a creative way or creative shot that I might have not thought of normally, which actually saves me a couple shots. Yeah. So harnessing it into beneficial, efficient ways is is um, definitely a negative. But the positive is, is like, just like you said, the the style and the clothes, my passion and thought into that yeah. has turned into something that I never thought it would have. Like, yeah. it's just, that's just who I am. It's me. I'm not trying to do anything different. It's just, I enjoy it. It's a passion. It's something that, um, I've spent a lot of time thinking about not on purpose simply because it's one of the many things that, um, I put my time and energy into. Yeah. Well, and it's, and you do it very well. And you said there were, you know, details, and that's something. As I was reading Casey Bannon's story, number twenty-five, um, detailing his his day with you at the players. There's a part in that story that gets into how detail oriented you actually are, like say about your schedule. You know, knowing how far it is from X to Y, um, and sort of keeping that part of your day in control. Um, is that because golf is a game that a lot of times most things are out of your control is, or is it hard to reconcile those, those two mentalities where it's like, okay, very organized here. And then when you're on the golf course, it's uh, there's a lot of things. The putts don't always go in no matter how, <laughs> what, what we try. It's, it's such a fine line to try to control the things you can and right. not let the things you can't bother you. Right. And I would like to think that I could find a reason why each and every shot did something or each and every outcome happened. And I'd try to like work backwards sometimes. I wouldn't call it excuses. I'd call it, you know, steps that I need to take to figure out how not to let that mistake happen again. Yeah. When a lot of times it's just bad luck, right? Exactly. And finding the balance of when to over 
analyze or, or critique too much and when to just kind of like let it happen has been, um, is it can be difficult sometimes. And honestly, it was really difficult for me in the beginning stages of my career. Like when I got on tour, you realize the pins are tougher, the greens are faster, the rough sticker. You got to be really meticulous about where your target is. And I didn't have that in my game. I kind of just flew by the seat of my pants and tried to hit great shots all the time. It would make a ton of birdies and a ton of bogeys. So when I added structure into my course management, it kind of freed me up a little bit. So finding that structure actually gives me freedom, yeah. which seems very, yeah, very different than most because I am so energetic in my mind of thinking and, and analyzing that structure actually calms me down in a way than just saying, Oh, I'm not going to worry about it. Cause like, I can't not worry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm it, when I have an off week, I'm always, if I just like try to do nothing, I go crazy. So I actually find peace in working on something, accomplishing something, thinking about something, creating something when that's on the golf course, yeah. it can go the wrong way. Like, Oh, I'm in the trees. I got it in the pine straw and I got to hit it if 200 over the water to the right pin. I'm trying to cut a four iron over there. Like I'm trying to come up with that where it's like, we have structure in your course management you hit it here, you hit it there. And the math says these are the numbers that's going to make, help you make the lowest score. Yeah. I found a lot of consistency in myself and in my game in that. Um, and so trying to implement that across the board is something that I've been trying to work on, whether it's preparation, practicing, you know, how much to work out, how much to practice, what to practice on. When you, when I can actually have those structures, I, I come to peace a lot more, a lot quickly, a lot more quickly. Yeah. You felt, you probably feel prepared. You've done your work. And so take us through that when you say course management and creating structure for that, how does that work at a place, you know, like Sawgrass or Augusta, you know, how do you, uh, implement, you know, good course management after I guess it was about three or four years I think it was four full years on tour it was a glaring difference in my performance on very tough golf courses I would say outside of majors because majors I was still kind of young wasn't getting into a yeah. lot of them but like just across the general PGA tour schedule I had a, a glaring difference in performance playing very very well at tough golf courses and behind the eight ball on short courses and the reason, uh, not short courses, excuse me, um, easier courses that people shot lower scores on. Mm -hmm. And the reason was hard courses force your hand to make good decisions because par is a good score. Like the Honda Classic, I won at nine under par. Yeah. A lot of these golf courses, people are shooting nine under in one round, right? So when I was at, when I won the Honda or Bay Hill or Quail Hollow, a lot of these tracks, even Riviera this past year, like I just feel like hitting in the middle of the greens okay mm -hmm. and two puttings beating the field a lot of the times. And when I was playing courses that were easier, I was aiming at flags a lot more, trying to make birdies, and in making trying to make birdies, I made a lot more bogeys. So that once I've kind of figured that out with some help of a lot of people that I've, I've been able to implement and I've started making a lot more cuts. I just started making, yeah. I think, uh, I don't know what the numbers are, but it was something like I was missing like 40 or 50% of my cuts to missing 10. And that's just a huge, massive difference. It just sure. raises your floor. Like my ceilings, I would say still the same until I can, you know, really get patient and start making some putts and, um, you know, competing on the weekends. But my floor has rised tremendously. So what are your, let's talk about your goals, right? So we're here in the off season, you're going out to practice this afternoon. Um, what are, you know, you're known, your driving has always been uh, a strength, uh, one of the best drivers on the tour, accuracy and distance. Well, first tell us, how do we do that? How do we hit really far and straight? What's the, what's your secret sauce? Uh, well, it's honestly, it's finding I was very fortunate to find what worked for me where I'm not technically optimal according to TrackMan. Okay. And finding optimal on TrackMan is not optimal for me. Okay. I've learned that my distance and my dispersion are a lot greater when it comes to when I'm optimal. So like I hit, I'll never forget when I started hitting a fade full time with my driver. I might've said this before, but it was on the, 
let's see, 16, 18, I think it was on 14, 14 or, yeah, I think it was on 14 at Idle Hour Country Club in Macon, Georgia. I was with my short game coach at the time and told me I needed to hit fades with my driver. And I was like, that's, I'm not going to do that. Like, I'm going to lose distance. And he goes, no, you won't. And so he gave me three balls, hit three and three and hit three fades all in the fairway, miss hit a couple and then hit my normal shot. And I missed the fairway twice. And then my good drive versus my good drive with my fade were the exact same distance. I was like, okay, Mm -hmm. hitting a fade. There we go. And then I found in my equipment over time, why it works. I've used the exact same shaft since the fall of 2018. I've, I've used, I used a different model. I guess I wouldn't call it model, a different shaft of the same spec for about six or eight months, but I've used the same actual shaft for the majority of what's that almost six years now really yeah i guess five years whatever that math is <laughs> yeah it's in that range <laughs> you're, you're on but i've used the same so it's you know it's it's got dings in it dents in it whatever but that the way that shaft loads in my golf swing is i've tried a bunch of them because they don't make that shaft anymore i can't even find one that i like equally that's the same same model yeah and then i've learned that where the weight needs to be in the head I didn't know how big of a thing that was because I only work it left to right. And if you put too much weight in the back of the head, I can't, I can't let the ball fall right efficiently because when that weight's in the back, it's kicking it up. It's making the ball go higher, more spin and, and drawing when I want the weight in the front. So it has less spin, higher ball speed and makes it fall right. Mm -hmm. I actually had some conversation with Zuno about this for a while they would have to engineer my driver head specifically different in Japan to match that up because I had such a stark difference when they came out with the new driver this past year, it, they, it was designed with the weight already towards the front, but they engineered it just like my old drivers with the, all the reinforced weight in the front. Yeah. And I immediately hit it 50 yards, right? The first three swings, 50 yards, right? And I was like, the weight's too far far. I was like, well, we built it just like your last driver. I said, I understand you built it like my last driver, but the weight and the stock weight in this driver and the stock weight versus old driver are different. So the stock driver now is where it, my weight's supposed to be. And that's why I had the best performance. Because if you change the MOI after it's been designed into a different place, it's never as optimal, right? Because a driver's made to do this. Right. And then you move weight front or may weight back it changes the characteristics of how it was originally designed so this latest driver the mizuno driver was characteristic to my weight that i prefer in my swing stock which made which is why i've had the best driving i think the best year driving i've had over my last i guess this i've just finished my sixth year on tour yeah and i didn't have to do anything to it i just put it into my old shaft boom gone There you go. And it's, I don't know the handicap or the skill level of a player that that actually starts really making a big enough difference. But for me, it made the biggest difference. I would love to be in that position where, um, I mean, obviously golf, yeah, driver heads and and getting your weight and your shaft right, um, getting those combinations to work are are really essential for, for anybody. But to be able to talk like you're talking about, like just movement of a little bit of weight, making that much difference to be that dialed in is pretty, is, is pretty awesome. Um, is there a swing thought though? And so if you're, you're, your gear, you're dialed in on your gear, uh, what are you thinking when you're on the tee and you've got that driver in your hands, um, to, to hit that long, beautiful fade? I usually, I usually look where and set my body where I want the ball to start. And then I train my eyes to focus on where I want it to finish. Okay. So I only look once of where I want it to start because I try to adjust my body to that depending on how big of a fade I want to hit. It's usually only, you know, I usually don't like to fade it that much, yeah. but sometimes you want to give it a little bit more. So I just set my body where I want it to start. And then I immediately look at where I want to finish and don't take my eyes off that. So then I can react 
to, okay, my body's a little open and that's where I want to finish. How do I get it there? And so then I'm just reacting to my target as much as possible. Um, I've always had the feeling that I always, I guess it's, I don't want to swing a hundred percent is not right because you don't want to swing a hundred percent on your backswing. Right. You know, you want to swing a hundred percent the ball. I, I never really try to take anything off a driver and never try to like swing 80% or 75 to try to just try to get it in the fairway. I always feel like that's telling myself don't screw up and mm-hmm. I play terrible when I have that fear. So I always try to be really soft in the, my takeaway and my transition and then just rip it. And it kind of gives me a little bit of freedom to just, yeah. I'm swinging hard. I know where it's going to go. I know it's going to fall right. And if it doesn't, then I'm just farther up in the rough instead of farther back in the rough. Yeah. Now, I love how you're talking about letting your body react, you know, um, getting it in the right position and then letting your, you know, being athletic. Right. Right. You know, uh, rather than thinking about, okay, am I getting to this position? Where's my right elbow? That kind of stuff. Um, uh, setting up and reacting. It's, it's nice. It's got to be a nice way to play. <laughs> it, I would say I'm just very blessed that I've always been a decent driver. I wouldn't yeah. say that I was a very poor driver and I figured out some secret. I would just say I've learned to optimize what I have and what I've been given to, to the best of my abilities. And, um, you know, that's different for, you know, some people might have not had speed or, or that's not their most confident club, which is the same for me in other areas of golf. Yeah. And, you know, trying to figure out how to make those better is one thing, but I've always been fortunate that I've been a decent driver of the ball and I've just tried to perfect it, tried to just make it as efficient, optimal as possible. And a lot of those things aren't the norm, if mm-hmm. that makes sense, because I agree that if you put a track man down and you make the ball launch X, Y, and Z at this speed, it's going to go farther. If I tried to, I, I've done that. I've tried to do that, and my numbers drop dramatically because of repetition. Because golf is all about repeatability and nothing else. Yes, there's ways to hit it farther, higher, more spin, but if you can't repeat it, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And I don't care your technique, your, your numbers, whatever they may be, up, down, fade, draw, straight. If you can't repeat it, it does not matter. And I've just been able to repeat this little bit of a fade with a with my driver if I get the weight and everything right in the shaft and the head that I don't have to worry about as much because I know that my repetibility is repeatability is just so much more consistent so what are you working on what else are you trying to optimize in your game what goals do you have uh for this year uh that you're working towards I would say putting just in general is is such a feel thing and I really want to be better. And it's really hard to understand what makes a putt, how to get better at putting because you have the green itself, which you really have no control over. You have the grain, you have the grass, you have the break, then you have the speed. And you haven't even hit a putt yet. And you have all those things that you have to calculate, which is almost impossible to, to, you know, aim points definitely helped a lot of guys try to combat those variables. Um, And then after that, it's about hitting a good putt. And then how do you hit a good putt? It's your stroke, it's your grip, it's your setup, it's your putter, the loft, the lie, the weight of that. There's so many variables that you can, that you can equate into hitting a good putt. Oftentimes we write all those down, go through all of them, go through the checklist, do everything, and the putt doesn't go in. And then the one time that you have an old putter that might be completely not even specced out to you at all, you barely read the putt, you walk in, you just slap it one-handed, and it goes in the hole. Yeah. It's it just it's it blows my mind. Where is the balance of what we talked about, just reacting yeah. to actually going through your checklist of of what you need to do to hit a proper putt and finding the difference. I've had success in both, right? Sometimes like I got a new putter. I understood why it worked. I trusted it and I made great putts. And other times I'm just like, man, I'm not even barely reading this putt. I'm not even going to take a practice. I'm just going to walk up there and hit it. And then it goes in. So like, where do you find those balances? Yeah. I think you find it a lot of times in practice and a lot of times in performance. 
you can separate the two, great, but it's really hard to on the golf course. You made big improvements in your short game, working with the Short Game Chef we featured on uh, on the podcast and our YouTube video series, and we were talking earlier about uh, different ways, the different ways that say you are chipping or pitching the ball versus like a Victor Hovland and how that swing should grow out of the way that you naturally swing the golf ball, swing the golf club. Um, tell me about your thoughts on that and how is, how has that been a big part of your, your improvement? It's, there's a lot of chatter out there about what's the right way to do something. Right. And again, I, I think it always goes back to what's repeatable for that individual, not necessarily what your coach thinks is most repeatable and why I'm saying what's repeatable to that individual and their feels because I would imagine most guys on the PGA tour got to their, to where they are because of their natural feels and abilities of hand eye coordination, hitting a ball and learning how to do it. Right. It's really hard to, you know, take somebody and just teach them every single, this is how you grip it. This is how you take it back. Whatever. A lot of guys just pick up a club and they just, it's natural. It's, yeah. it's rhythmic. I would say Victor has one of the most natural. When I say that, it's like, I don't want to say unconventional. It's just like, that's his move. Right. Yeah. And it's his repeated move. He repeats it so well in his golf swing. It's unbelievable how great of a ball striker he is. He aims, he aims right, which is against wisdom. You know, he has a lot of side bend. He has a lot of, a lot of things that a lot of coaches would say aren't traditional. But it doesn't matter because he repeats it so well. Well, he's found now a way to chip with the same repeatability and the same feels that he has in his golf swing. I had the same kind of realization with Parker because I have very little hinge in my backswing. It's really wide. I never really set the club. And I kept I kept trying to have a bunch of shaft lean and kind of hinge it and get into the um, kind of hit down on the ball and compress it into the turf. And I was, wasn't consistent at it. And he's like, look, you don't have any hinge in your backswing on your golf swing. Let's do the same. And then instead of feeling like you need to trap it, I want you to feel like the bounce hits behind the ball, which he's like, not necessarily a throw. It's a body turn. I want you to keep your hands in the same position and turn. And if you look at my golf swing, I have a very little hinge and a lot of rotation mm -hmm through it and so now i'm like wait i'm doing the same thing as my golf swing and that's how i'm supposed to chip too and it just like clicked immediately and now i learned how to how to my short game just became so much better because now my the feels that i kind of i don't know what the right word is but the feels that i had success with in my golf swing and the feels that were comfortable to me when i was hitting really really good golf shots were now the same feels i'm working on on my short game, producing good shots. I think Brian Harmon is another great example. Brian and I chip a lot, and we've he's very cerebral and goes back and forth. He has a massive amount of hinge in his backswing, right? But he also unhinges it very well. If you told me to do what Brian did, and I all of a sudden I had to hinge like crazy and then dump it, I would probably those were against all the fields that I know. It'd be something completely foreign to me. And when you're at our level and you're under pressure and you're trying to do something foreign, it's, you have doubt. And I think a lot of teachers have had a lot of success with certain individuals because their feels match what that teacher's teaching. And a lot of teachers and students don't have success because the feels don't match what they're teaching. And sometimes it's just trial and error. And yeah. it's really scary as a professional to like go work with somebody. And then if those feels don't match what your feels, even though the teacher's right, like it's optimal or it might, you might understand it, but if it doesn't match your feels, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And so I, I got to give, you know, Victor a lot of credit for finding a chipping motion that matches what he likes me the same way, harm in the same way. A lot of guys the same way. Yeah. And some guys are searching out, like whenever you see a guy struggling with part of his game, it's because his feels don't match with what's happening. And if you, those don't, if those don't match, you're lost. But it gives me hearing you talk about that gives me hope. Struggling with my pitching right now, you know, trying it this way, that way, and the other way, 
and there's just you know maybe the idea of like what's repeatable what feels natural to me what feels like my golf swing maybe that's what i should be working on versus and, what i've been seeing necessarily <laughs> yes 100 you know. yeah and then you find yeah. out what your inefficiencies are when you do that and right. then you fix those right so like if you feel like a lot of hands going through the ball and then you might your wedge and i might your ball position might be in the wrong place or your wedge grind might be off you can still feel that change a couple things and you can feel it and it come out efficient yeah no it's fantastic all right, let's get away from the golf course for a bit. Keith, looking around and, and reading up on you, you seem like a man who, who likes some of life's finer things. <laughs> Tell me uh, from food, you know, food, clothes. Who doesn't, though? Watches. I like them. Right. I mean, can't e have even them. people that don't like right. the best of something. <laughs> right? I know, but... I mean, Cred over here wants the best, you know, setup, best cameras, best whatever, right? Did you best just call what did you just call him? Cred. His is his nickname. I call him Cred. I know. In his uh in the in the golfer's journal piece, he wouldn't say what his nickname was. Really? No. He said Are you embarrassed? We're Well now that he said he's Casey Bannon's in the room, everyone. If now he says he's embarrassed, this. we have to tell the story, right? Yes, please. Let's so, get into that. <laughs> we're driving to the BMW in in uh Delaware in the sweet BMW that they gave us for the day. He's in the back. And I'm pulling in, and the guy's like, you know, stop. I need your, you know, we need to see your credentials. So I hold up my tour card. Yeah. Like, legit. Like, we actually have a tour card for okay. those who don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm holding up my tour card, and the guy's kind of looking at it slow, and, and cases in the back goes, I think it's, I think you got it backwards. Flip it around. And I just turned around and looked at him. and was like, do you don't think that I know that my tour card has two sides to it? <laughs> like, Stay in the back seat, buddy. <laughs> so I just started calling him cred, like credential. And so now it's just it's That's it. cred. Sorry, Casey, it's out. And now you are <laughs> cred. You're cred. <laughs> Thanks for being here, cred. <laughs> so where does that come from, though? You, uh, This sense of style, this sense of like being into into food and into other, other stuff that, um, you know, might not be of interest to others. But uh, what's it about for you? Food's a family thing. My sister is, and my mom, like my mom loves cooking and food. And my sister is, a, and she lives in New York City. And she literally texted me this morning, I'm going up next week, like six restaurants. So she's, which one do you want to go to? We get reservations at this. It's just, it is what it is. I don't know what, but my, my dad, I mean, my dad would make like homemade Caesar salad dressing back in the day. Like, I mean, who does that, <laughs> right? Like he would get all the ingredients and do it. And my mom would make dinner almost every night and we didn't have my sister and I didn't have a choice like whatever she made we ate it yeah. wasn't like what do you want for dinner it's chicken fingers and french fries like it was none of that it was whatever she made that night we were eating and I think it kind of trained us to enjoy food yeah and I also feel like it has a little bit of that adventurism or adventurousness that you want to seek something out or find new or create because I mean how cool is it to for me to find something new, whether it's a new dish or a new way to prepare something. Like, I mean, I cooked last night. Um, we made some tacos after um, the Worldwide Technology event down in Mexico. They had these steak tacos, and they were my favorite steak tacos. So I've been trying to implement, implement, uh, implement them here at home. And um, I made this great steak and tacos last night. It was well, do you want to share the, the recipe here with the, with the <laughs> listeners or any, I mean, any tips? I, I like steak tacos, Keith. I got this really nice ribeye, which who does that for okay. tacos? I was like, going to say, yeah, more like a flank know? steak typically, yeah, exactly. right? But I did just salt and pepper and some little bit of taco seasoning and then put it on the Traeger for probably an hour and a half at 200, 225. Ooh, bold. Just depends on how much time you have. And so to get to the internal temperature to write it about 120 take it off and then my smoke alarm went off for about 15 minutes last <laughs> night because i was searing it so hard in the skillet that we had all the doors open the fans on waving at everything because the smoke alarm was going off because so you cook all right you get it to the temperature and then you're searing it and then i'm searing it so okay. I, so that way because when you have a really thick piece of meat that the internal temperature if you cook it high on both sides it, it's like gradual if you cook it slow and slow it's all equal throughout the steak. So you can have a medium rare from edge to edge that's still warm instead of having like uh, kind of like right. crisp, medium, well, medium to medium rare. So you got, that's why, but if you have to have a thick 
cut to do that. Okay. If you have a thin cut, it, it's just it's going to do that anyway because yeah. it doesn't matter. So I've, I Chris Kirk, I would say is one of the best best at it he does he takes it seriously too and he's oh, yeah? he was the one who's like look i swear by the low and slow and then sear and so after he kind of you know told me how he did it i've been trying to do it as well and you just have to have you know obviously a thicker cut low slow and then sear it i don't have he has an infrared sear outside so he doesn't set a smoke alarm off yeah. i just try to do it on the skillet and the cast iron i just got one of those <laughs> i'm pretty psyched about it but i was searing first Right, I thought, oh, you sear it first, lock the lock the juices in or whatever, and then cook. Okay, I was doing it backwards. Well, there, you can do it both ways. Well, I like it's, it's, a, it's a preference thing, and you know, food. I would say food's one of them. Clothes has always been a thing. I don't know how you get into like it's weird. Like, how does a kid like especially yeah, how'd you get into guy, clothes? Yeah, I don't know. Like, I remember my dad took me to this store in Chattanooga one time, and and um, he got me. I don't know what it was. Just maybe. It's, pants and dress shirt or whatever and I just like really liked the store and the stuff and it was weird I was like getting clothes for Christmas at a young age when like most kids were getting like BB guns and, and you were happy and well, you liked the clothes it it's was, usually you get the clothes from like your aunt it wasn't like, like underwear and socks it was okay. like a, you know it was something cool yeah, I would like, like to think like my dad got me a, a belt buckle one time that had just my initials in it there's you know those little small square belt buckles mm -hmm. i think they're like they're coming where well, i'm trying to make them come back but you know it was something that he gave me his that he had his initials and he had his granddad and my granddad his dad's had his initials like some of those things i just That's thought cool. were really cool yeah and then when my granddad passed away when i was in eighth grade my dad engraved his watch because he had it engraved and he engraved it again for me and like it was more the sentimental value that or what it represented more than anything, and that's kind of what started me into into watches. Like, okay. I I had my granddad's watch. Yeah, that, that was so cool. It, made, it reminded me of him every time I looked at it. And it had a purpose too. Like, you know, everybody wants to watch see what time it is, but it had more than just that. Right. It was my granddad's, and I think that got me into that. Again, I don't really know. It's just something that I've always been been into well it's cool i think that you know it's always interesting to meet people in golf that aren't just can't can only talk about golf or where that's their only interest or uh and it's and it's probably very healthy to have all these other things towards which you can you know devote mental energy to uh rather than everything or do you feel like your life is all about golf if it wasn't for golf i wouldn't be able to experience what I've experienced in all these other avenues right. like I have been able to. So golf is definitely the root of all of this. And it is also what I did for fun my whole life. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it became a job and I'll never forget the difference in when golf was fun, it was because it was after school you know, you had to go to school all day, then you got to practice, and you got to go to tournaments in the summer. And then even in college, you had to go to class, and then you got to play golf. Now it's like I go play golf, and that's my what I, what school was is what golf is in terms of yeah. the productivity. Like, So it's my job now. So I really had to find that outlet outside of it to kind of balance – I would say my life because golf was just my hobby and fun. Now it became my job. It be I actually put a lot more time and energy and pressure into it to perform mm -hmm. high. So then I needed a break outside of it. And so now I just kind of channel it through all these random hobbies and a lot of them coexist in golf now. Like yeah. I have watches as part of a sponsorship and you know, clothes as part of a sponsorship. I mean, I haven't found a way to get it for food yet. Have to get a food. Well, you could, after people listening to this, you might get a, a steak deal or a, a grill deal, it sounds like. Is golf still fun? Absolutely. Right. Always will be. And I found a fun way to do it. Like, I found some old clubs. I, I did it a couple of weeks ago. Got my 975D out and Tyler's PT3 wood. And, there you go. Now you we're know, talking and I went and played, and I didn't care where the ball went, right, because I could blame it on the clubs. If I take my actual tournament clubs out and hit a bad shot, I'm already critiquing myself. What did I do wrong there? What did I need to do right? right? 
And so when I take that fun set out, it just, I enjoy golf for what it is again and not necessarily like trying to hit every shot like I want to. There you go. Another fun thing you're interested in life. I guess people are, if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see we're drinking out of these styrofoam cups oh, yeah. with a, uh, with a Jeep golf cart called El Jefe. Um, you, what are you restoring a Jeep? What's going on here? So I had this amazing idea in, in the, fall of 2018 that I was going to sell my Tahoe and I found this Jeep online. I was like, this is going to be my day to day car. This is it. Like I'm going to drive a 1977 Jeep Cherokee chief S wide track every day of my life. And that was as a, you do. <laughs> that was a very romantic thought that it was completely <laughs> unrealistic, which I would like to think a lot of my thoughts are that way. But I got this Jeep. It got delivered with through the, the delivery story is a whole nother thing. And they delivered it to my address in Chattanooga because that was on my license at the time because I just moved down to St. Simon's. I had changed it. Then I had to get it delivered again. I mean, it's a nightmare. <laughs> I think I paid more in delivery costs than I did in, in anything else. <laughs> But, I mean, it broke down like two days after I got it. You know, it didn't even start the day I got it because the battery had died because they had left something on in the delivery. And I was like, this is absurd. Like, I, this was the coolest idea yeah. I've ever had and is so unrealistic is the best way to put it. So I've put some time and effort into it. I've put some money into it. I've learned the tricks of the trade. Like, it doesn't run great in the summer because it's a carburetor and it's – um it's not, it's just air cooled, right? So then I have all these, all these little nuances about the Jeep that I've learned. There's a little bit of rust on it because it's in salt air down here. So I don't want to patch it up. I want to just completely restore it at one point, but thank goodness for, uh, Tim Rittenhouse. Shout out Tim for pulling me through about a month later. Um, I got a, I signed a BMW deal for, for a car. Mm -hmm. And so, he saved me so big time because I mean, I was stuck with this <laughs> Jeep that barely ran. And I mean, it goes after you go about over 45 to 50, the engine starts getting a little hot cause it's working really hard. So I was like, I can't even like drive to the airport and, and know that when I land again, <laughs> that's going to start. Yeah. So anyway, it's, I've put some, it's taken a lot of love and it runs great, you know, right now. All right. Is so, it here? Yeah, it's downstairs. Okay. It's in the garage. Well, we'll go check it out later. And anyway, yeah, I guess the cups are, so I had a friend, some. when I did my, um, when I set up my foundation, you know, they did some logos and stuff yeah. for me and they just kind of asked me my hobbies. I told them about the Jeep. So they just drew the, they drew the frame of the Jeep into a golf cart and um, my wife got you took that image and then gave it to um whatever made some cups for me so sweet. i thought it was cool so you mentioned friends tell me about who are your friends can you have friends out there on tour in this solitary i mean you're a professional golfer uh you've got coaches you've got people in circles and sponsors and all those things but friendships can you have real friendships out there yeah if you can't then you're then you're a stone cold killer i guess and i mean there's plenty of people out there that might think through that attitude but they still have friends yeah. uh, i mean i'd like to think that um i have a good time you know I, I, if you really get you get a good group of people you actually try to help each other out you know yeah. you're just not one-on-one -on -one. if it was one-on-one -on -one every week that'd be one thing but it's one versus 150 like you can't you, know, you try to beat one guy and he finishes last like who cares you know or you it, it's it's never really that way so i mean last week i stayed in the house with harry higgs and he's one of my good buddies and great guy he's the best and you know there's so many different personalities and people come from walks of life in different ways yeah. it's just i mean yes you're absolutely headed, you're headed off to the zozo or any of the events you got coming up like what who do you want to be paired with not that you have any sign it but like what's your you pair with something, you're like, man, this is going to be a good day. It, it's You always get excited when you get paired with your friends, but you never really treat it any differently. You feel like you should talk to them and hang out with them more, but then you're both out there to work. Yeah. So I would say the friendships, you know, from 
the time you walk off 18 till the next day you show up at number one, not necessarily from one to 18. Yeah. I would do, I do say it's different, but if I really want to get paired with people, I like to play with people that are fast. I would not say I'm fast. Um, I would hope I'm not slow. I was slow a couple years ago. Um, I've tried to work on that. Um, I like to play with people fast. I think everybody on tour would say that. I don't think anybody would, would disagree with that. Um, and I mean, that's really it. Like, I mean, most 90% of the guys out there are awesome anyway. Who do you not want to play with? Come on, <laughs> tell us. Come, come on, on, come on, come on. Please. Come on. Okay. So it's, shooter's got to shoot, Keith. Um, I was going to do a what's in the bag, but I'd rather with you do a what's in the closet. Okay. To le- and you're building a house. So is that where you're putting all your focus, to be honest, like on, on the layout? I am, of your closet. No, of my closet. No. You know you've studied it. <laughs> of, I've studied every inch of that thing. I love, I'm sure you have. I love architecture. I, I love it. We're using an awesome firm out of Atlanta, Stan Dixon, and his team. Um, and I've had so much fun diving into the plans that I care about where the walls go and the secret doors back into a different room and the – windows shapes and all that and then my wife we're <laughs> she's doing all the fabrics and i just don't care i don't care the colors i don't care yeah. what it is i'm more of like the brick and mortar functionality sure. and she's cares about you know how it looks in the inside and that's great i don't it's a perfect match on how to do this i'm having so much fun doing it i got my own little room it's got a secret door to another secret door from my closet back Ooh. into the other way i mean it's, yeah plans are right there but i mean you're going to have to secret see it in doors. <laughs> Multiple. Multiple secret doors. Yes. You're li- you are living large. Um, I mean, it's the door. You can just cover it up. This doesn't cost any different. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. What's the layout of the closet going to be then? <laughs> I want to hear about this. Are there going to be closets off of closets? Secret closets? No, no secret closets. Secret, secret watch door area? In the closet into the into the my I don't know office slash okay. other kind of room but I would say that I mean we we had to make room for my suitcases I mean we travel so much that I wanted my I wanted my big suitcase to be able to fit in my closet okay. so I never had to drag it in and out and pack somewhere different I could just right. put it all right there when I'm home just take it all out I feel that yeah, because the suitcase is always in like the guest room right. closet on a show. Yeah, exactly. So nice, we made nice. sure that we could both my wife and I have a space in our closets to okay. put our suitcases, so that when we travel, it's just right there. And those are like the little things yeah. that a designer and an architect like can help you find out that you would that even I wouldn't even dream of thinking of. So that's, I mean, all those little things are fun. Um, I, we're, we're doing this little wine room that has, you know, obviously a secret door to get into that. And then I got my favorite bottle of wine that I was like, I would call it, some people call it your epiphany wine, that w- the wine that got you started into wine. You're going to pull that bottle. Mine was a box. Was it? Yeah. And that's what made you like wine. No. no. And you like everything. <laughs> well, 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 that's for a different podcast. Um, no, tell me about tell me about your epiphany wine. <laughs> well, that's gonna be <laughs> that's gonna be the one that you're gonna pull and it's gonna open up the door into my like kind of office. Oh, get out. Area. Yeah. When you pull the bottle of wine out, the We're door gonna, opens yeah, up. Yeah, we got some we got some uh, It's like Indiana Jones stuff. Man. Yeah, well, I learned it from a place in San Diego. Um, one of this design firm called, I, th- I think it's pronounced of Rocco, but I'm not sure. But a sponsor of mine, Josh Boniface, took me to, um, took me and my caddy, John Lamonti, to dinner there, presented us both um, a Daytona, white and black. It was super cool, surprised us all, and took us in this Italian restaurant. You had to have a card to swipe into like what felt like a library. And then you just like walking around, it's just a bunch of books. And then there's one book, you pull that book, yeah. and then it opens up the door, which goes into the the like speakeasy area nice and so I, i'm completely copying this like That's this cool. is not i mean you know, obviously my own take but it was so cool i was like if i ever build a house i'm doing this this is amazing that's pr- and so we're we're trying to figure out a way to do it that is really cool um do you remember the day that you decided while we're on the topic of fashion that you were going to be a visor guy oh i mean day one Day I mean, one. There's a picture of me that I put up on my Instagram 
that, I mean, I can't be more than four years old, five years old wearing a visor. What? Yeah. Oh yeah. It's out there. And my dad always wore a visor. And so, you know, everybody wants to look, looks up to their dad and he was a cool yeah. guy wearing a visor. So I started wearing a visor mm-hmm. and you know, it's, it's just part, it's, I didn't wear, I wore a visor all the way through high school, all the way through college. And then I signed with Nike right out of school and they didn't make a good visor. And so I wore a hat. And then when I signed with, um, two other companies that were, I got a better deal out of it than my current deal. Um, then I went back to the visor and there I've been go. with it ever since you got, I'm, you, I am in my, you got the good head of hair for it. Not everyone can pull off the visor. I can't. And plus, Why not? I get, well, I've got a lot of things going on up here: color, shape, color, like the color of your hair matters. I don't know. You want to? It's 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 very bright. And then up here, it's you a little should. thin. And so I would be getting the burn sunscreen. Hello, I'm not rubbing sunscreen into my half covered scalp. Why? I don't know. You rub it everywhere else. I do. Everywhere I've tra- else. I I have some. <laughs> I have some visors. It takes a certain confidence though, Keith. Why don't you have it? I have it in other parts of my life. I just don't know if I have it in, in headwear. Um, so we change this podcast over. What are those other parts of your life that you have this confidence in and I'm asking the questions? Yeah, well, okay. Um, I've got confidence. I don't, I don't, wow. I don't have any confidence now that I think about it. I had then, confidence let, going into this interview. Let's and start just, with the I visor. <laughs> Step one. <laughs> All right, visor. Well, it's just visor. It's in that arena of bucket hats. You know, like, it's just, you know, you're saying something. And, uh, all right, I'll well, wear a visor. But I do, that's probably the main reason. With the fair skin and the light hair, like, I'll get the burn here. And sunscreen. Et cetera. So I'll sunscreen it up. You're right. I am. I am. Uh, I got this. The new sunscreen. That's the uh, the clear kind, and just put it in. I love it. So, um, let's let's get you on it. Let's let's give it a shot. Can you get me a visor? I can get you. I can definitely get you a visor. Can we go in your closet later and get some visors? <laughs> okay. Um, you've given us a ton of time. I can't thank you enough. This has been so cool to be down here. And what a, this is like one of this is one of my favorite places in the world to come down to St. Simons and Sea Island. And uh, if folks haven't been here, and you get to live here all the time. It is, we are so lucky. I was, I, I think we talked about this before we started, but I could never realize why I would move. And I felt like it'd have to be an external source, right? Because yeah. I moved here for golf. And then I've obviously like, who wouldn't want to be here in, in general? And so that's why we're building a house. Because when my wife and I got married, she loved it more than I did. So we're like, we're, we're staying. This yeah. is it. This is our spot. You know, we got three golf courses at Sea Island. Um, we got the GPC. My coach is there. Mm-hmm. Um, my trainer's down here. We got the amazing practice facility. Then you have Ocean Forest, which is on Sea Island itself, but where they play the Jones Cup. It has yep. a Walker Cup. It's one of the hardest golf courses I've ever played, so I can actually play there and know how I'm playing relative to a PGA Tour course. Um, you know, and Seaside, obviously, is a tour course as well. Scores are low there, but Ocean Forest is tough. So yep. we have that, and then you have a great practice facility down at Frederica. Like we're just so fortunate to be able to live in a place that I feel like on the East Coast potentially has the best weather 12 months a year. Like definitely South Florida is better in the winter and then definitely up North is better in the summer. But for 12 months, it averages probably better than most because it's not too hot in the summer. It's not too cold in the winter. And it's perfect. Like you're here at the perfect time, obviously, October. I mean, it's amazing. It is amazing. And you have a good group of other tour players down here, tons. which is interesting. There's tons. tons. Um, how do you? That'd be the only thing, though. You guys fly all over the place. I guess you're, you're jumping in your PJs. My pajamas. You know what? what I mean. You know what I'm talking about. I don't. I mean, I. Where do you I, fly? I don't, I, don't, I don't wear pajamas. Don't <laughs> how do you get out? Do you go down to Jacksonville, or do you go to the little airport here? Yeah, it's just whatever. Okay. All right. We know the answer to that question. <laughs> no, that's my only issue with, with you know, there's a little bit of a there's a little bit of a commute. Uh, I'm going to Tokyo. You know, <laughs> flying straight out of here, straight to Tokyo, right? Uh yeah. Saint <laughs> Simon Saint Simon's to Tokyo. Let's just say this. The Twice longest daily. flight I've ever seen, and I'm not gonna throw the guy under the bus. But let's just say that he played in the RSM. Okay. Okay. It was the last term of the year. And his plane went from here. To Europe, okay, and the runway. These things take off right over. Yeah, right, it's right over in town. Here. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I remember sitting there looking. I was like, it was like a 13 hour flight that if from here home, it was epic. I was like, this is wow. the longest flight I've ever seen out of this airport. So now it's nice. You know, you mentioned the RSM, you get a nice say, uh, you get a, you get a home field, um, event every year too, being on, uh, St. Simons, which is, uh, which is pretty great. So I'll just leave you with a nice, light, easy question, Keith, before we go raid your closet. Um, we just had a podcast with Sean Foley, and he talked a lot about purpose. When you think about your purpose, tell me about your purpose. Oh. I, I told you it'd be just a nice, easy one. <laughs> oh, what man. gives you a sense of purpose? I would just say I am probably the luckiest person to be blessed with this, you know, God-given talent to play golf right it's i mean it's an athletic ability i don't even i don't know what you would call it right i can't jump that high i can't you know i'm not like an athlete right but like i've just been given this talent of golf i've been given the opportunity from my parents and how i grew up to you know really explore that talent to the best of my abilities whether it's through tournaments and coaches etc and I've been able to use that as now my job, which has now become a platform, which has now given me so many other opportunities outside of that, that I would never have had without it. And it just makes me want to do it well, do it properly, correctly. Um, and because I don't want to, I don't want to waste any sort of thing that I've been given and or really don't deserve necessarily like I don't deserve this talent that I've been given I don't deserve the the opportunities that I've been given throughout my life so I just want to make sure that I I do well with those and lean into them for because it's it's I'm just very thankful for them and I don't want it to to go to waste and whether that's through golf or through, you know, any other alleyways of charity or other businesses or help things I can help other people grow with. Like I, I take such pride in my sponsors of trying to find value for them for what they pay me for. Like they're paying me to play golf, right? And play golf at a high level and for brand recognition. But like, I also want to provide something for them and their company and what their company is all about because me making three, four birdies doesn't really necessarily change their bottom line where I could potentially change their bottom line through help and through, through my, I guess, relationships and things that I just want to use golf that I, the talent that I've been in golf across the board in any way, shape or form. And whether that's through Sid Mash wearing my clothes and selling cashmere sweaters to worldwide technology, getting, you know, Fortune 500 companies signed up with them or Cisco. I mean, I can just go through the list, but like golf helps me do that, which helps me do more things leading to sitting here, you know, talking shop about my life. That was really refreshing. That was awesome, Keith. Thank you. Uh, And thank you for your time. This has been a blast. Keith Mitchell from the cover of Golfer's Journal number 25. We didn't even really get into Casey's wonderful story as much as I wanted to. Oh, which one? Let's keep going. We got time. I got nothing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What is this? On? Let's so, tell us about the cover of yeah. number 25. We can we can revert this to the very beginning of the podcast if we so need. So I can, Your detail and control stuff, I get it. Because you like usually like no one would note that or be aware of like where – not the cover, but where you could put something in a podcast. Like you're always thinking about how things uh, – like even this setup here, you were thinking about where to put stuff. It's a disease. It's awesome. It's a disease. All right, tell me so about anyway, the cover. That shot is – so if you remember the um, the video on Twitter when I smashed my club and then the horn went off and then the you know ball flying in the water, we Do were we done. remember it? We were done for the day. We'll never forget it. We were done for the day. Yeah. And so I had to come back out the next morning to finish. And that was where I – this was that shot. So. Okay. That was the where you after your drop? Yeah. So it was funny. I remember talking to Johnny. <laughs> I was like, 
I honestly think I'm going to drop this ball in the first cut on the down slope instead of the tee. So if you look, it's like <laughs> you can see that I didn't drop the ball on the tee. I dropped it in the first cut on the down slope. Why? Yeah. It's because I was hitting a three wood off the ground. Okay. It's kind of tight, narrow up there. And the first cut was just the right height that it wasn't ever going to sit down. And it was so it was it was just a little bit higher, so it was going to sit up, and I could get it. It was almost like a T. And then the downslope just kept the ball low, and it kept it running, which I needed. So it's like I think I'm going to drop on the downslope right here. And he's like, I love it. <laughs> and so there was obviously a lot of water right there because it was due. It was first thing in the morning, first shot. And then um, it was it that shot started out the rest of the day because I hit it right in the fairway, hit my wedge shot up there, and made the putt, made five, yeah. which I would have paid an ungodly amount of money to make five after that drive. Yeah. Like insane. So then that led me to make the cut, which led me to finish, I think like 30 something, which got me in the masters. Got you in the masters. So that shot was the shot after the shot. Right. If that makes sense. Well, cause people, you know, that kind that, that clip sort of went a little viral there of the, uh, block smash horn splash. Right. But the, you know, the, the second half of that story is coming out the yeah. next day. This is it. The shot, it is. the shot after the shot, getting it done and going to the masters. So, I mean, that's pretty wild. How does like, all right. So the amateur golfer, me, whatever, you know, I, I, I do something like that in a tournament or just in a round with my friends and I go into shutdown mode. Oh, I was pissed. in shutdown mode for hours. Remember, it was I had, kinda nice. you had, the I had like yeah. four I think I probably had fourteen or fifteen hours till I had to hit that next shot. So I the, <laughs> I refuse to sit here and say, Oh, I just, you know, forgot about it and focused on the next <laughs> shot. Like no chance. I was yeah. so mad. If that delay hadn't happened, I might have not made the cut. Yeah. So well, you know, as out. as as horrible as that was, I mean, you can always turn it into you know, a positive. Yeah. But that is still across the board. Something that I know between great players and good players is an ability to like, just play tidier golf to make mistakes and like turn them into bogeys instead of doubles. And, um, and what you did there was, uh, was pretty sweet. What else, Craig? What you got? Favorite golf courses. Favorite golf courses? Top five. I can do top three. Um, in no particular order. Uh, the honors course in Chattanooga where I grew up. Um, that's a big, heavy emotional bias, but I think people would also agree that it's a, it's, it holds its own. It's a very good golf course. It's pretty hard, man. It's, it's extremely hard. It's definitely up there. A hoopy. I love a hoopy because there's so many options. It's, it's a refreshing time to play golf out there because it's not just like fairway green, two putt, fairway green, two putt. Like there's shots that you would never have anywhere else. They might, some people might think they're gimmicky. I don't care. Like it's fun, right? You're not out there to, I don't know, or you're out there to have fun. That's it's the fun. whole point, right? It's a fun park, man. And then um, I would say Fisher's Island is is one of just. I mean, Seth Rayner. I, I think was it Seth Rayner CB, or both. I don't know. The golf course architecture nerds are definitely golfers journal people so i don't want to say that you got to get there right what we do in that instance is i say mcrainer <sighs> and then it just kind of covered gotcha <laughs> mcrainer I, mcrainer it's a mcrainer course and it is just amazing the views the fact that it's very i wouldn't say very easy t to green but if you put those pins in the in the in those yeah. tight spots it's really hard to make birdie but still easy to make par it's very hard to do these days in architecture. People always say that that's what they try to do. That's their philosophy. Make it hard for the, you know, professional and make it easy for the amateur. Yeah. That is no better done than at Fisher's Island, in my opinion. Interesting. I can see it. I mean, it's in, I, I never looked at it from that actual, from that angle. And it's short. I was just shocked that they, that I got on it. It's right. it's a short the right. length is short yeah. you know and so anybody can play it and they put those pins in the tough spots the greens get fast and then the wind blows yeah. I mean come on it's I think that place is 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 not only is it scenic the views you know it, all of the above but the fact that that McRainer <laughs> did <laughs> this, such a this good new, job this new guy McRainer <laughs> better than anyone any course that I've ever played like that is is easy for the easy you know 
in moderation for the amateurs and difficult for the pros depending on the pin placements. Yeah. He he did it better than anybody I've seen. A hoopy strong call. I was with your buddy, um, or at least you would know him through Sweetens Cove, Drew Holcomb. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, last week, and he said to say hello. Uh, he's an Ahoopy guy as well. He had a fun story about getting the call to to uh, to become a member there. Um, the uh, you know he would go to the member guest and bust out the guitar at night and sort of became a, a part of the hang and uh, he loves it there. And there's a lot to love. Um, but you're involved in in Sweetens Cove, aren't you? I am. Um, I've been very fortunate to be part of that. Um, I, I always get updates from those. I feel like a lot of them are hoopy guys, you know, get updates from right. when I'm yeah. there. Um, and you know, it's, again, it's just, I didn't really care about bourbon originally. And then now I feel like I, I got a bourbon collection. It's incredible. I know it's 10 AM and you've already had three. Exactly. And that's, and that's why they're in styrofoam. So nobody styrofoam knows. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and I got to practice this afternoon and exactly. that sweetens is hot. It's like 58%. <laughs> so that's probably why I've stumbled over my verbiage so much. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. McRainer. Um, <laughs> but it's been fun. It's, you know, talking about like clothes. I mean, I collect so much stuff. Yeah. Um, but I collect it because I love it. Like it, it, it just the highest quality of anything is good. The highest quality podcast, highest quality golf, right. highest quality vintage Texas hat. Like I've, I've probably bought 25 hats in the off season. These vintage Texas hats, the company went out of business in probably the nineties or early two thousands. And they made this amazing hat and they've been done. And I've, I've been finding all of these all over, all over the internet and Instagram. I got like a, LACC hat. I got a Pebble hat. I got a Kiwa Island hat. And they're all from like the like new old stock from the eighties. It's so cool. Bourbon <laughs> the same way. Um, you know, thank goodness with Sid, I get my I get my clothes, or else I'd have a serious problem that way. But I just all things, man, all things. That's just I, how do you? You're so good. <laughs> it's just you're so good at golf when you have time to like research finding Tex Ace hats. It's infuriating to people who say if I uh, could practice 12 hours a day, maybe I could be that good. Who but said I practice 12 cool. hours a day? I'm saying that's what I think you have to do to be good. <laughs> no. But you don't. No. Because hey, obviously you're, you know, you're out shopping for... Be maybe if I wasn't, I'd be better. I don't know. But I just got to... I mean... You, you got to be you. Yeah. And there's plenty of time. I mean, how much time do you look at your phone? At least look at your yeah, phone by trying to collect something cool or learn about something. It's a good point. Like my Instagram, I feel like is all information based. Yeah. Whether it's the information of a gilt dial submariner from the 1960s with chapter ring and double signed, or is that a what is is that a watch? Exactly. Okay. See? I don't know if we were <laughs> still talking insane. about hats or wine like, but that's or what, what I was. that's what I learned on Instagram, not okay. about anything else. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um. Yeah, Keith, this is uh this has been such such a treat. I'm um Are we gonna finish the chess game or did you did you Oh yeah, collapse? that's how I wanted to wrap this up. Did you collapse? Did you, are we done? No, here? this didn't this just the wind blew my king over. Oh, that wasn't checkmate. Let me I'm put sorry. that let me put that back. So uh <laughs> That's my piece. Oh that's your piece, <laughs> but can I use it? Checkmate. <laughs> dun dun dun. <laughs>